Hepinize iyi akşamlar. Son İstanbul ziyaretimin üzerinden uzun zaman geçti. Oldukça uzun. Özlemenin artık hasrete dayandığını söyleyebilirim. Bu yüzden Sayın Hazır Özlemenin davetine ne kadar mutlu olduğumu size anlatamam. Hazır Hanım bu ziyaretimi mümkün kıldığınız için tekrar teşekkürler. Zaman ayırıp konuşmamı dinlemek üzere buraya geldiğiniz için size de çok teşekkür ederim. Maalesef Türkiye'ye yaptığım ziyaretlerin sıklığı azaldıkça Türkçemin gerilediğini hissediyorum. Bu sebepten oturu bu akşamki konuşmamı Türkçe yapmaya çalışırsam kekele kekele hepinizi bura, burada sabaha kadar tutacağım. Bir misafirin böyle bir şey yapması ayıp olur. Bunun için izninizle konuşmayı İngilizce yapacağım. Kusura bakmayacağınızı umuyorum. I would like to open with a love lock. As you all know, the love lock was a common trope for the beauty of the beloved in Ottoman poetry. The particular love lock I wish to open with belonged to a young apprentice who worked in a clock shop in Istanbul in the late 18th or early 19th century. The apprentice was immortalized in a gazelle written by the poet Refi Kalai, born around 1750. Let me quote a few couplets. That clockmaker's boy stole the reason from his lovers. The wound of his scorpion hand curl works its way from the case of the skin inwards. When the son of his beauty is in the Scorpio of his love lock, everyone in the world is customer. The demand and profit of union with him increases by the hour. His sun-like cheek shows no sign of setting, but secretly he bespeaks the fast breaking of union with him. Now, if you can't understand most of it, that's fine. This poem is like a locked box holding the remains of a temple world that is now mostly extinct. It's loaded with uh, images. It's full of puns and wordplays that are lost in translation. And sea miles that we cannot access. In fact, it's uh, more like a conceptual black box at first. But if opened, it may tell us something. Uh, not only about time-related concepts and practices, but also about the challenges of doing Ottoman cultural history. European travelers in the 19th century often found non-Europeans to be unaware of time or indifferent of time, attributes that were sometimes associated with their alle alleged laziness and lack of civilization. The early academic study of temporality was informed by a similar approach. Modern European time was the standard against which other temporalities were measured and similarly found to be lacking. This perspective encouraged thinking in dichotomous terms that helped emphasizing difference, even exoticizing it. Thus, for many decades, scholarship contrasted, for example, clock time, meaning European clock time, with natural time, on the other hand, or empty secular time, read European secular time, with religious time, and the list can go on. What little work was published on Ottoman time was mostly framed by such dichotomies. Ottoman temporality was typically reduced to a single concept of time that had been religious and traditional, and contrasted with a similarly uniform, one-dimensional, secular, or, or, and modern concept of time. Mechanical clocks were assumed to be, by definition, representatives of secular empty time, and therefore supposedly alien to indigenous culture until European, again, concepts of time took over in the early 20th century. So this was the, let's say, standard narrative. In what follows, I will examine 
time <clears throat> and the use of, clo of clocks in the Ottoman Empire, not against some ideal type uh, model cast along late 19th century Western European lines, but in terms of the temporal culture of the Ottomans themselves. By temporal culture, I mean a whole ensemble of time-related practices, conventions, values, and emotions that structure the temporal dimension of social life and fill it with meaning. Within this ensemble, I will distinguish between the conceptualization of time and its organization, as in ways of measuring time, ways of announcing time, ways of structuring daily routines, and so on. For most people, after all, time is not a concept. But first and foremost, an everyday lived experience they don't quite conceive of, but mostly feel through countless practices and conventions. Would it be considered rude to call in this hour? What would happen if I arrive late to that meeting? What are the margins of being on time anyway? We are all bound by such conventions, whether we are aware of them or not. Most of us don't consider the essence of time every morning, but we still have to be at work at a given hour every morning. In other words, for most of us, it is the organization of time, however conceptualized, that matters most. Another distinction that is useful for analytic purposes is between historical and quotidian time, or everyday time. People's imagination of long stretches of time may not fully correspond with their experience of or attitude toward time as they experience it in everyday life. Having explained the terms I will use, here's what I would like to do. In the first part of my talk, I will try to say something about the inner logic of uh, Ottoman temporal culture in the 18th century. Ottoman temporal culture, I argue, rested on the assumption that time was part of a divine order and could not be dissociated from it. It was a dense fabric of practice and meaning that bound together heaven and earth, society and nature, and the fate of humans with the course of planets. By claiming correlation with heavenly rhythms, Ottoman time served to legitimize and reaffirm the very mundane social political order. In contrast to extant assumption, mechanical clocks did not conflict with this system in any way, but were rather absorbed within it and made to serve it. The Ottoman concept of zaman, literally time, cannot be explained outside this complex ensemble. The question I will try to answer in the second part of my talk is what happened to this temporal culture over the 19th century and why. While the extant literature argues that change in what regards time began only in the second half of the 19th century owing to the introduction of new technologies, I will argue that the transformation began already in the 18th century mostly in the late 18th century, and grew out of everyday governmental needs, seeking solutions for very practical problems of governance and military efficiency, Ottoman officials began experimenting with new techniques of time organization. A more comprehensive change in the concept of Zaman occurred only when these changes on the level of time organization were associated with new linear notions of historical time. In other words, changes in the way time was organized predated changes in the way it was conceptualized. The study I present here will soon be published in Turkish by Ishbanka Sekultur Yerinlilu under the title Alaturka Saat Okumak, Geç Osmanlı İmparatorluğunda Zaman Betoplum. The book relies on a wide range of sources, including bureaucratic correspondence, military manuals, school textbooks, chronicles, newspapers, memoirs, and diaries. In the first part of my talk, however, I will favor poetry over all other sources. 
Poetry was the most venerated genre among Ottoman elites and an integral part of their socialization and everyday life. It served much like a reservoir of images and conventions that were shared by the elite of the empire. Poetry was central in assigning meaning to a wide range of phenomena and in scripting social behaviors. In my talk today, poetry will serve to bring us closer to the terms and images used by the Ottomans themselves. I hope that by the time I finish, Kalai's couplets will, and the temple world of which they were part will be somewhat more intelligible. So, 18th century Ottoman temple culture. The Ottoman inherited the term Zaman from their Arab and Persian predecessors, and like them, saw Zaman as part of a divinely sanctioned cosmic order that was determined by the movement of heavenly bodies. Like in previous periods, Ottoman understanding of these movements relied on the geocentric model of Ptolemaic astronomy, according to which the Earth is surrounded by nine spheres that are constantly revolving. In Ottoman literature, the revolution of the zodiac, the spheres, and the planets is often hard to distinguish from the time they measure and from the, its supposedly auspicious or inauspicious nature in astrological terms. These notions can be seen, for example, in Ottoman almanacs. And here's an example. Much like contemporary European almanacs, Ottoman almanacs in the early modern period included not only different calendars used in the Ottoman Empire, Rumi, Hijri, and Jewish, and Orthodox, but also an astrological forecast for the year. We have to keep in mind that belief in astrology was widespread across Ottoman society, and the imperial court employed a chief astronomer, astrologer, Munajim Bashe, who compiled the official almanac for the Sultan, complete with astrological prediction, and advised him about auspicious and inauspicious times for going on campaigns, holding ceremonies, or appointing new officials. Ottoman almanacs, then, not only broke duration into units of uniform length, as calendars usually do, but also marked these units as qualitatively different from one another. Some days were holy, others profane. Some hours were auspicious, others inauspicious. The assumed nexus between the cosmos, time, and human fate is evident in words used in different types of literature. For example, the word sipir means a celestial sphere, but also time and fate. The word felek similarly denotes both sphere and destiny. The word devir denotes the revolution of celestial bodies, the passing of time, as in devri zaman, and also a reign or epoch of dynastic rule that is influenced by these revolutions. These circular movements, therefore, do not exert influence over time. The effect is understood as integral to time itself. Such beliefs are reflected in Kalai's clockboy poem. When the son of his beauty is in the Scorpio of his love lock, everyone in the world is a customer, mushteri. The demand and profit of union with him increases by the hour. The beauty of the boy shines like the sun, right? Another common trope for beauty in Ottoman poetry. And patrons flock to the clock shop, not for the shops, but for the young seller. Hence the rise in demand and profit. But the boy's beauty also carries the danger of heartbreak for the, poem, for the poet. The boy's love lock is here described as the dangerous tale of the scorpion, Akrep, which is also, of course, the minute's arm of the mechanical clock. The clock, clock's arm measures quotidian time, but that in turn is affected by the constellation of celestial bodies. The word for a customer, mushteri, also signifies the planet Jupiter. 
to which the conventions of Ottoman poetry assigned the role of a justice in the court of the heavens. The sultan of that heavenly court is the sun. According to Ottoman astrology, the time when the, the sun is in the house of Scorpio is inauspicious. As customers of the beautiful boy flock to the shop, the poet's chances of winning the boy's heart decrease. The court of the heavens has sentenced the poet to heartbreak and devastation, in keeping, of course, with long-time literary conventions. This is only an example of the way heavenly bodies, the, the time they measured by their movements and their influence over the fate of humans were almost inseparable. I believe that there is a connection between these circular images of time an Ottoman imagining of historical time. Writing about the etymology of the word revolution in European languages, Reinhard Koselek noted that during the early modern period, the word usually signified circulation or return to the point of departure and was closely connected to the circular orbits of planets and the cycle of political structure structures discussed by different classical writers. It was only after 1789 that revolution gradually assumed its modern meaning of sudden interruption of an old order and the beginning of a new era for which history can hardly serve as a guide. Ottoman imagining of historical time in the early modern era was not dissimilar. Ottoman writers often list, linked the great corrupting power of time and its cyclic patterns with the rise and fall of dynasties. And of course, we can think about Ibn Khaldunian uh, uh, notions um, that were common in Ottoman political writing. These notions were closely associated with the idea of the order of the world, Nizami Alem, according to which the social political structure was part of a larger divine order, and hence there could be no alternative to political order other than that of the Ottomans. If the Nizami Alem broke down, or Ottoman social political order broke down, the world would be in chaos. Being integral to this divine order, Zaman, could not be manipulated or changed in any way. All humans could do was to try to ascertain it and then align themselves with it. These notions were reinforced in a wide range of texts, from manuscripts about astrology and astronomy through court chronicles and on to court and folk poetry. It was the daily prayer cycle that translated these notions into a lived everyday experience. So here I move from ideas to practice. The prey cycle regulated early modern Ottoman institutions from bureaus of the uh, central administration through religious colleges, libraries, and public baths, and onto markets and soup kitchens. The call for prayer functioned like a public clock of sorts. And it appears that before the second half of the 18th century, People in the Ottoman domains, regardless of social class, rarely referred to time in terms of specific hours. Rather, people would say things like, just before the noon prayer, or between the noon and afternoon prayers. So, as a public clock of sorts, it's, it's one that constantly <laughs> ties the people who abide by it to celestial divine rhythms. Calculating the time of prayer was the, wall, uh, was the role of time setters, or muvakitler, derived from the Arabic word wakt. Vakit, like zaman, is usually translated simply as time, but the terms are not synonymous. Without going into too much detail, we may say that vakit and evkat had a slightly more quotidian connotation and is more commonly used to denote clearly defined durations or moments. This was time as experienced 
as lived, used, be that for mundane pursuits or for worship. Indeed, while vakit was more quotidian than zaman, it was certainly not more profane. It may be correct to refer to vakit as a piece of zaman, and therefore as carrying the same divine essence. Muvakits were members of the ulama and uh, were trained in religious colleges around the empire and employed in larger Ottoman mosques. They were charged with establishing time, mostly uh, prayer and fast times, with utmost precision. The calculation of these times depended on observing celestial bodies and relied on detailed astronomical tables. The daily cycle of worship was thus supposed to accord with divinely created rhythms. And the Muvakit was in charge of maintaining what David King has called synchrony with the heavens. The Muvakitlers throughout the Ottoman Empire operated under the authority of the Munajim Basha, the chief astronomer of the court. Moreover, Muvakitanes were built and maintained by sultans and high officials and served to advertise their power, piety, and benevolence. The Ottoman mode of time reckoning was thus not only in synchrony with the heavens, but also with a more easily identifiable power structure on earth, the sultan's power structure. The function fulfilled by the Muvakits on the religious, political, and practical levels contributed to the longevity of the institution. Indeed, Muvakits did not disappear, even when mechanical, mechanical clocks became more widespread in the 18th century. In fact, many of them became expert ologists. Now here I begin to consider the way mechanical clocks were absorbed within this ensemble of practice and meaning that I call Ottoman temple culture. So by the second half of the 18th century, thousands of timepieces, mostly of European manufacture, were marketed throughout the Ottoman domains every year. Here you can see a few examples. Yet the growing availability of clocks, at least among elite and urban middle classes, did not significantly change the basic conventions of Ottoman timekeeping, nor the world of meaning associated with it. Since the Islamic calendric day begins at sunset, the Ottomans quite reasonably counted their hours from sunset. People would set their clocks and watches to 12 every, uh, every evening with the call for the evening prayer, and or according to the clocks in a nearby Muvakitane. This system maintained some correlation between the natural day, the calendric day, the daily cycle of rituals, and the daily cycle of clock hours. All ended and began at sunset. Indeed, while clocks were without doubt more commonly used, the time they measured was not severed from the natural world, nor was it emptied from the multiplicity of political, religious, and cultural meanings it carried. The Ottoman clock time of the late 18th century was a far cry from the uniform and empty physical entity which is usually meant by the term clock time. First, there was the religious dimension, which, however, cannot be clearly distinguished from all other aspects. This is best illustrated in the clock, clock boy poem. I quote, his sun-like cheek shows no signs of setting, but secretly he bespeaks the, the fast breaking of union with him. By breaking the, the fast, the poet is clearly alluding to the fast of Ramadan, and the desired meeting with the beloved is compared to the iftar that take takes place at sunset following the evening prayer. Clocks do not determine the right time for the prayer or for the breaking of the fast. That role is reserved to the celestial bodies and as, as, as uh, interpreted by the Muvakits. 
but clocks could measure the time left until that impatiently awaited moment. In fact, every year toward Ramadan, there was a significant increase in the sale of timepieces throughout the Ottoman Empire, as attested by one late 18th century European observer. And I quote, a Turk during Ramadan is continually counting the hours and the minutes. It is then that the clock industry in Geneva receives the greater part of its tribute. That tribute could increase even further if, one, if only the clock hands could be made to move faster. Here you can see a late 19th century uh, illustration that captures this impatience uh, very uh, beautifully. And you can see that the clock is almost showing 12. It's almost time to eat. But there's another layer here that is far from pious. As I showed elsewhere, nighttime was the most suitable time for illicit sexual adventures of the, time, of the type the poet wishes for himself. And some other couplets in this um, poem I did not share with you are very highly erotic. Here's just one example. Eshkice shmim sel desem Naz ile o saat siler, indirip bindirmede uşakini çekmez güce. And there are a few other couplets that uh, can be read as even more obscene. In other words, the poet here is not interested in ritual. He impatiently awaits the clock boy to respond, possibly to finish his day of work. But the latter, the boy, whose beauty is like the sun that shows no sign of setting, prolongs the torment of the fast with his naz. This couplet demonstrates the coherence and inner logic of early modern Ottoman temple culture and the correlation between time organization and its conceptualization. The poet moves between the various daily cycles, all ending at sunset when the attractive clock boy like everybody else, would set all clocks in the shop to show 12. Rather than conflict with existing practices and notions, timepieces were made to serve them. The subjugation of clocks to poetic conventions and the, the conventions of time uh, uh, more generally demonstrates that clocks were thoroughly assimilated or better still, naturalized. By saying that clocks were naturalized, I mean, first, that they were fused into a conceptual scheme that was based on natural rhythms. Second, by mediating these clocks through familiar notions, as in familiar poetic conventions, these potentially disturbing machines were contained and absorbed Far from being alien then, clocks became a natural, integral part of Ottoman temple culture already in the 18th century. Rather than measuring supposedly empty mechanical time, Ottoman clocks measured zaman, complete with its auspicious and inauspicious moments, its religious load, and no less important, its conservative implications. After all, underlying this whole system of meaning was the notion that human society was part of a divinely sanctioned cosmic order. Within this order, the sultan was the link between heavens and earth, the shadow of God in this ephemeral world. The clocks in all imperial muvakitanes not only sounded the authority of the sultan, but established his divine legitimacy. For the, furthermore, this system relied on the authoritative knowledge of state-supported ulema, who in turn supplied religious legitimacy to the state. It is therefore significant that it was the ulema who knew, the only ones who knew, what time it was. Here are two examples of uh, 18th century Ottoman-produced timepieces which 
demonstrate, I think, very well uh, the extent to which these machines were naturalized in the Ottoman Empire. So, and here I move to the second part of my uh, talk. What happened to this conceptual fabric in the 19th century? Well, at first, nothing. In the second half of the 18th century, the Ottomans were trying to cope with a devastating set of military defeats, with a failing economy, a powerful provincial governors promoting their own agendas. The decentralized state apparatus was ill-equipped to meet these challenges. And more and more people within the elite were forced to admit that change was needed. Some of them put forward reform plans, and with the accession of Sultan Selim III in 1789, these ideas turned into a comprehensive reform project that was meant to reconfigure the military, the fiscal system, and various areas of uh, central, provincial, and urban uh, government. Despite multiple setbacks, the reform widened significantly over the following decades. It is against this background of early reform that I propose to place the beginnings of the transformation process I will discuss in the coming minutes. Starting already in the late 18th century, various organs of the reforming Ottoman state began devising new techniques of time organization in an attempt to uh, attain better surveillance capabilities um, and increased regularity, efficiency, and predictability. These organs gradually developed elaborate methods of time organization, methods that increasingly relied on mechanical clocks and timetables. For example, as the natural, as, sorry, as the central administration took on additional tasks in the late 18th century, the heads of the system sought ways to squeeze more time out of their scribes and began to define the workday in terms of clock hours rather than prayer times. Procedures were increasingly time-framed as were office routines and penalties for those violating the new temporal order. So scribes had to be from this hour to that hour. They would get a break between this hour and that hour. If they were late by so much time, they would be penalized, at least in principle. Effectively, they were most often not penalized. Um, so the daily cycle of prayer was no longer um, adequate for this time of minute time organization. Here is a, a much later cartoon from the early 20th century uh, that nevertheless conveys the nature of these efforts of time disciplining the uh, officials. These efforts were not limited to the administration. Uh, instruction, were, instruction books commissioned for the new army established in the mid 18, 20, uh, mid 1820s, followed, following the eradication of the Janissaries, prescribed clock-based clock maneuvers that were designed to optimize the coordination and efficiency of the newly assembled fighting units. Soon after, camp routines and battle plans too were spelled out in increasingly more punctual terms, relying on clock hours. Leaders of the new style education institutions, Usuli Jadid um, institutions that were established in the second half of the century, similarly found the calls for prayer insufficient for minute temporal regulation. By organizing instruction according to standard units of time and devising clock-based schedule, they hoped to facilitate better transmission and surveillance over the pedagogic process. In short, mechanical clocks that had previously been used by individuals were now increasingly used to regulate a variety of new institutions. These reforms gradually diffused beyond clearly delineated state spaces 
such as bureaus, military compounds, and schools, into the main arteries of big cities. In the second half of the 19th century, transportation systems, including ferries, trams, and railways, used increasingly more punctual designations of clock times to facilitate regular, efficient, and safe traffic. You can see a few examples of clocks. You can see the clock here in the uh, bottom left. This, this is a major hub, of course, and this is why the clock is so much needed here. There was another clock on the other side, and they were both electrified. This is 1914, I think. And, of course, Sirkeji, uh, the timetable is from uh, Izmir. And this is from Aleppo, Halev. So clocks were now needed on the public sphere for people to be able to adjust to these new clock-based temporal order uh, uh, uh, structures. It may be said that these changes were at first limited to the sphere of vakit, but a rift was opening between the organization of time that was being transformed and its conceptualization, which remained pretty much intact, at least in the first half of the 19th century. The concept of Zaman began to change as Ottoman elites began to associate quotidian clock time, increasingly conceived in linear terms, with historical time that was similarly conceived in linear terms. The latter, historical time, uh, conceived in linear terms, was integral to the evolving discourse of progress. Put in the crudest terms, the notion of progress presupposed a universal timeline or a temporal axis along which different groups progress towards the future. Modernity or civilization, Medinit, was conceptualized as the most anterior temporal location on that timeline. Differences between human groups came to be understood in terms of temporal distance. Starting around the middle of the 19th century, Ottoman intellectuals and officials began using this model to think about the condition of their empire. They now thought not that they were merely weaker than Europe, in military or economic terms, but rather that they were lagging behind Europe on the journey to civilization. These were their terms. Consider, for example, the closing passage of an article written by Namik Kemal under the title Teraki, Progress. The article, published in 1872, was an idealized description of contemporary London which, according to Namik Kemal, embodied every aspect of progress. So he describes London, and then he closes by saying that, and I quote, as Europe has got into this condition of progress in two centuries, and they had to discover the means of progress, whereas we find those means ready to our hands, if the work be properly taken in hand, there is no doubt that in two centuries, at any rate, we shall be able to get into the condition to be counted one of the most civilized nations. And as regards two centuries, are they more than a twinkling of an eye in the life of a community? So we have here the imagining of Europe as found, in a sense, in the future for the Ottomans. They are ahead of us, the Ottomans. But if we do our work properly, and we have the means, we only have to take them in hand, we will be able to close that gap and finally be counted among the civilized nations. Now, within this intellectual circle, and those people known as the young Ottomans, industriousness and productivity were considered one of the most crucial means to achieve that pro progress. 
In their writings, mostly in the 1860s and 1870s, they echoed European and American discourses that tied material progress to economic behavior on the level of households and individuals. The notion of progress and the related emphasis on time thrift and productivity were closely related to the Ottoman imagined community that these same intellectuals were trying to forge. In order for that community to uh, progress, yes, to move along that uh, um, imagined historical timeline, each individual, now a member of that community, had to work hard and economize on time, as if it were possible to strike the time saved through efficient hard work from the temporal distance that had opened between Europeans and the Ottomans. Faster was the new dictum. We need, they said to their readers, to close the gap. The term usually used to refer to this quotidian time that needed to be saved was vakit, as in vakit nakitir an expression introduced into Ottoman Turkish by this very group. Those intellectuals used essays, short stories, and novels to popularize these notions. Um, and you can think about, uh, for example, Ahmed Midhat's uh, stories and novels in the 1880s and 90s, uh, and you will find so much of this, uh, these ideas in his novels. Um, so, uh, this discourse was uh, promoted uh, so much that by the 1890s, um, the discourse of what was called the value of time, vaktin kimeti, had already been incorporated into official educational programs and taught in state schools to both boys and girls from a young age. In short, through their novels, school books, journalistic writing, and translation work, Ottoman thinkers and state officials preached about the importance of productivity, punctuality, and thriftness, uh, thriftness of time for personal and imperial progress. So, quotidian linear time measured by clocks is linked to this historical linear time. Here is an example of uh, this new understanding of uh, time uh, from the first issue of Asker, a journal published by and for the new schooled elite of the army Im immediately after the Young Turk Revolution in 1908. In this piece titled Chalushalim, the editor of the journal, Osman Senai, calls upon his fellow officers to work harder in order to strengthen the army, secure the constitution, and make progress. Attaining these goals, Senai argued, depended on the efficient use of, of time. And I quote, our armed forces are the support of the motherland, the united center of our pure and holy hopes. Let us, let the progress and promotion of this force always be our strongest hope, our eternal thought. In fact, in the present situation, excuse me, we have little time. However, the true merit is to demonstrate work in times like these. Let us take the English proverb, time is money, vakit nakitir, as our guide. For Senai, for Osman Senai, this all had very practical implications. Saving time, he writes, further down, and I quote, has attained such importance for us that we simply believe that without it, it will not be possible to form a complete army. The times already set for work, he continued, were just not enough. It was the time between the different tasks, so he recommended to his readers. The time between the different tasks, the time set for recess that needed to be utilized. So his text uh, shows that in his mind, uh, time is always framed, always put into the rubrics of a timetable, just like he would have learned throughout his long 
military education. Tabulated and efficiently used, time can be saved in the race for progress. Here is another example of the way linear, quotidian, and historical time are woven together. This is from a text uh, with the very same title, Chalishalim, taken from a school book uh, published in 1911. Industrious nations, I quote, always move forward and are manifestation of perfect felicity. Let's get to work or let's work in order to obtain the best education. Let's put all our efforts into carrying out our human duties. Time passed for nothing seems long and worrying. Laziness is a source of regret. Let's get to work. The well-being and progress of our beloved motherland, of our honorable nation, depends on this. We see here once again the idea that if the energy and effort of all citizens is combined and the unnecessary waste of time is eliminated, the Ottoman nation would leap forward. This is, I think, an understanding of historical time that is significantly different than the one with which I opened. So if this was the nature of change in the concept of time, what were the dr uh, forces driving it? So I'm trying to explain now, okay, we understood what drove the changes in the organization of time in the first half, beginning in the first half of the 19th century, but what about these changes in the way time was conceptualized? From the short presentation, it was evident that technology mattered, but it was only part of the story. My explanation for this change, conceptual change, which I can only state very briefly here, is socio-cultural. Changes in the concept of time were driven first and foremost by these rising groups of educated officers, bureaucrats, and urban professionals, promoting new ideologies raised away from the madrasas and bred on a new textual diet. The graduates of late Ottoman state schools were removed from the traditions that had shaped the temporal concepts and scripted the time-related behavior of earlier generations. They were detached from the court poetry tradition and its cosmology and alien to the world of cyclic images of time and auspicious hours. The universe was no longer geocentric, and the uh, uh, time no longer synonymous with fate, an uncontrollable entity that subdues all humans. Time, for them, was rather one more object of reform, another frontier to be conquered and ordered, measured and put to good use. Acculturated in highly regimented environment of schools and barracks, they identified efficiency and temporal regularity with progress and saw themselves as the most capable of leading the nation forward. And again, these were their terms. They mustered new media, new genres, and new sources of authoritative knowledge, most notably science, and set out to combat temporal patterns they associated with the old political order. In other words, this was a struggle for hegemony. When these groups took power, increasingly after 1908, the hegemonic concept of time was finally emptied from the old uh, uh, meanings of Zaman, a process that culminated in the abolition in 1926 of the old hour system, the Ala Turkasat, and the calendar, the Hijri calendar. Now, there are several conclusions that can be drawn from this discussion, but I will contend with one as we are quite literally running out of Vakit. Concepts interact in intricate ways with daily life. This is where concepts are put to, to work, so to speak, and this is where we should be examining them. The precarious, ambiguous, and const constructed nature of concept is concealed behind the seemingly stable facade of routines and social norms. Built into the cityscape and organizing technology, concepts 
become techniques. So for example, the abstract notion of an hourly order built into clocks that look at us from every corner helps us forget that the hour is a mere convention. It is by grounding concepts in the quotidian that these agreed upon fictions are made real, turn into a seemingly natural part of reality that appears to be self-evident. It is on this level of the lived experience that gaps between concepts and needs are felt at first. If the gaps between an organizing concept, such as Zaman, and the way it functions in social life grow too wide, the concept loses its efficacy. It may change significantly or die out. Then, with time, what has once been homely becomes alien. And concepts that had been intuitively accessible have to be taken apart like a clock in order to, for the mechanisms to be examined. It is this gradual alienation that eventually turns a poet, uh, sorry, turns a poem that would have been almost readily understood by its addressees into a conceptual black box that needs a long analysis to be opened, like a key to a love lock, if you wish. Thank you very much. <laughs>